There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. I'm supposed to talk about the practical implications of sexual roles in the church. I have down here six things I'm going to try to get in as concisely and quickly as possible. Somebody has said that the two elements of a good speech are a good beginning and a good ending and try to get them as close together as possible. (laughs) I always told my students at the seminary, stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and shut up to be appreciated. (laughs) The question was raised this morning for the panel as to why it was that the rules which apply to the submission of women specifically apply in the, in the home and in the church as an operating body. And Dr. Walke said he wasn't sure he could answer the question as to why, and I said I thought maybe I could, and I realized that sounded extremely arrogant. I think there is an answer. The working out of the answer is not simple. I don't mean it's not easy. It may be, it's a simple answer, but it's not easy in its practical application. But to me, it's very simply because there are two theaters in which a drama is being played out here on earth. And those two theaters are the church and the home. That is why we are given very specific instructions as to how we are to relate to each other. When God ordained the tabernacle, he took Moses up to the top of a mountain and he revealed to him in exquisite detail the pattern of the tabernacle. There wasn't one single corner, there wasn't one fire pan, snuffer, shovel, basin, bell, pomegranate, candle stick or anything else which God didn't clearly describe and specify as to dimensions and materials and decoration. We don't have the tabernacle anymore. We are a living tabernacle, each of us, and the church is a living body. I cannot stress too strongly the importance of mystery. I spoke of it yesterday, and I don't think we need to bother talking about the practical applications of sexual roles in the church if we disregard mystery. Then we're just so far off that there's really no use in talking about it. We need to recognize that a a heavenly mystery is being enacted in these two arenas or theaters here on earth, which are the Christian home and the local, visible church in its function as a church. Dr. Walke has pointed out that the created order is the pattern. We look back to a created order and we look forward to the fulfillment of this heavenly mystery in the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, looked to John like a bride. He said, I saw the bride and it was the New Jerusalem. And the marriage supper of the Lamb, as has just been stated, is the culmination, the total fulfillment of all that sexuality means here on this earth. And so this heavenly mystery, which is referred to again and again throughout the scriptures and most definitively treated in Ephesians 5, is the mystery of Christ in the church. And because... The man stands in the place of Christ in both the church and the home. He is the initiator. Because the woman stands in the place of the bride, she is the responder. And so, to me, that that is the, the reason, clearly and unequivocally. I attended 
what was called the Evangelical Women's Caucus in Washington a couple of years ago, and I listened to one woman describe what she considered the biblical pattern of marriage, which was egalitarian. And she claimed that her marriage was an egalitarian marriage. Everything was 50-50. Her husband brought home 50% of the bacon and washed 50% of the dishes, and so did she. And everything worked just beautifully, and they liked it that way. And so this was a model which was worthy of imitation. She took the view that we have an unlimited array of options, that the egalitarian marriage is one of the legitimate options of a Christian. And she used as her Magna Carta, Ephesians 5. This was her text. And the thing which I find so deeply disturbing about the women who call themselves biblical feminists is that they use exactly the same texts that I do. <laughs> and she started right in by saying that the only thing Paul is trying to tell us in Ephesians 5 is mutual submission. Everybody submits to everybody else. Fit in with one another because of your common reverence for Christ. You wives must learn to adapt yourselves to your husbands as you submit yourself to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife in the same way that Christ is the head of the church and Savior of his body. She did not go so far as to say, uh, parents submit to your, to your children or masters submit to your slaves. But the implication was that all these relationships which Paul spells out are just examples of what ought to be a completely mutual relationship. So when the opportunity was given for questions, you can be sure I asked one. And I said, would you see any difference at all in the way a husband is to submit to his wife and a wife submits to her husband? Are they interchangeable and exactly identical? She said, there is no difference. I said, may I then take this passage and substitute, interchange the nouns? She said, yes. And so this is what I read. You husbands must learn to adapt yourselves to your wives as the Lord submits to you. For the wife is the head of the husband in the same way that the church is the head of Christ. And she stopped me. Oh, she said, you can't carry the analogy that far. A very cowardly cop-out, since she was the one who had used the analogy to prove her point and then given me permission to interchange the nouns, having said that the nouns were interchangeable. The absurdity was intolerable, even to her. Why is it intolerable? Because we're talking about heavenly verities, eternal mysteries, Christ and the church. And the most profound truths any philosopher will tell you, any poet will tell you, any theologian will tell you, cannot be grasped purely intellectually. We are reduced to the language of metaphor. The greatest truths in the world must get into our hearts and minds by means of metaphor and imagery. And the Bible is loaded with metaphor and imagery. We have the imagery of Christ, uh, of God and the people of Israel as the bride and the bride, the bridegroom and the bride, and we have the metaphor in the New Testament of Christ and the church as the bridegroom and the bride. And far more is at stake here than can ever be argued about, pinned down, proved in the laboratory. These are heavenly mysteries, and the, the church and the home are the custodians of those mysteries. It is in these two areas that these heavenly mysteries are guarded enacted, played out day after day after day. Consequently, we are not at liberty to tamper with this imagery or to govern our behavior by taste. If I don't happen to like being submissive and my husband does not happen to like being the initiator, why shouldn't we reverse the roles? I feel comfortable this way. We're told nowadays that we're supposed to feel comfortable in everything. 
You do your thing, I'll do my thing, whatever your thing happens to be. No way. The word has been spoken. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We can sit around endlessly, endlessly discussing, struggling, grappling, debating, working through things which do not need to be discussed, debated, grappled with, and worked through because the word has been spoken. And this is the word. You wives must learn to adapt yourselves to your husbands as you submit yourselves to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, in the same way that Christ is the head of the church. And he goes on specifically describing the relationship between a husband and wife, and then even Paul, that incandescent intellect, has to confess that there is more here than he can possibly describe, he says, the marriage relationship is doubtless a great mystery. But I'm speaking of something deeper still, the marriage of Christ and his church. So, the role of the woman and the man in marriage governs our roles in the church. And this is the practical basis. We cannot determine our roles by competence. I think that has been clearly enough spelled out by Dr. Waltke and others. It's not a question of competence. Women have the same abilities that men have in most things. There are some very interesting biological data which would prove, even in the laboratory, that certain uh, kinds of aggression are hormonally determined. If you want to read more about that, read The Inevitability of Patriarchy by Stephen Goldberg. It's interesting to us Christians that biology backs up our theology. We would not feel that our theology collapsed if we couldn't find laboratory evidence to prove that patriarchy is inevitable, but I think it's very interesting. And so it, it's not a question generally of competence, although there are some differences between men and women intellectually, emotionally, physically, which cannot be denied. So when somebody says to me, but I feel as though the Lord has given me a gift of initiation. Some woman says this to me, so what am I supposed to do? Well, she's talking to the wrong woman. <laughs> because I don't think anybody could read a word I write, listen to a word I say, or look at anything that I've done in my life and imagine that I am a woman incapable of initiation <laughs> or incapable of making up her own mind or of introducing a new thought. It has absolutely nothing to do with competence. I don't disagree with the ordination of women because I feel that women are not spiritually competent to be ordained. The roles of men and women are not earned, they are not deserved, they are assigned. My husband is my head, not because he prefers to be, not because I'm, I don't know enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not intelligent enough, I'm not amiable enough, I'm not virtuous enough, but because God said it. And there's an end to it. Hierarchy is the opposite of tyranny. It's not the opposite of equality, as has been eloquently pointed out, equality fits into hierarchy. In the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial, three persons, and willing and glad submission between them. But to refuse God's order of the roles of men and women is a form of tyranny, as C.S. Lewis points out, where Natural superiors refuse to rule natural inferiors. This is a form of tyranny. Where natural inferiors rule natural superiors, this is another form of tyranny. And we have not the liberty to tamper with this God-given design. It's one of the facts of the universe. We can say two and two makes four, 
Or we can say two and two makes five. You might prefer two and two makes five, but that doesn't change the fact that two and two will always make four. My husband used to say that the, dif the distinction between a neurotic and a psychotic was that a neurotic person, a psychotic person says two and two make five, and a neurotic person puts two and two together and comes up with four and he can't stand it. <laughs> well, I think that's the trouble with a lot of us. We, we know perfectly well that this is in the cards. This is built into the structure of the universe and we can't stand it. Well, settle it once and for all. That's neurotic response. I was going to talk about Galatians 3.28. I think Dr. Waltke has dealt with that quite adequately because, of course, it is the verse which is always thrown up. What about the equality expressed in Galatians 3.28? And in, in that verse, there is neither male nor female, neither bond nor free, neither Jew nor Greek in Christ. It is in the context of the qualifications for baptism. There's no question at all of our competence. We are competent, but we are assigned a certain role of ministry. There is no question at all of whether or not we may belong to the body of Christ, regardless of what our social or racial or sexual status may be. But in Christ there are differences of gifts. Nobody could listen to what I say, read what I write, and imagine that I'm a woman who does not believe in the use of gifts. So often women call themselves feminists with a very muddy understanding of what that word means, thinking that it means that women are supposed to fulfill themselves and use their gifts. I believe in the full use of gifts always within the prescribed framework of the church. And I get challenged, of course, many times that the things I do belie the things I say, I think I can answer any question at all that may be raised about my ministry to mixed groups. I always work within the framework of the church and under the authority of men. I would never consent to speak in a, in a mixed meeting where women are in charge of everything. Churches nowadays sometimes think it's cute to have a women's Sunday and the women lead the singing and take up the collection and they'd like to get me preach. Well, they don't get me. Because to me, that is a hideous distortion of the way things are supposed to be. As for my teaching in Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, naturally, I was teaching more men than women. And the simple answer to that is, it, it is not the local visible church operating as a church nor is InterVarsity, nor Young Life, nor any Bible study group that you're holding in your home. There are ways in which women may use their gifts there differently from the way they might use them in the structure of the church. The key word is, the key phrase is the usurping of authority. All practical questions that come up as to what a woman may or may not do in the church, go back to that. Is she usurping a man's authority? Now, the question is not adequately answered by a woman saying, nobody else will do it. That will not do for an answer. Again and again, this question arises. Nobody else will do it. What can we women do if the men refuse to do it? My answer to that is, your disobedience will not help their disobedience. The best thing that we women can do to help you men is to be women. The best thing you men can do to help us women is to be men. God is most perfectly glorified in a man's being most manly and in a woman's being most womanly. And for me to abdicate my position as a woman and to take up that which has not been given is to go back to the original sin of Adam and Eve. They took that which was not given. It's my responsibility to be a woman to answer the call of femininity. It is the man's responsibility to be a man to answer the call of masculinity. He must answer to God if he has refused the order which has been assigned.
It is not a question of personal preference. Sexuality is a question not only of what we do, but of what we are. And so, let's be very clear about what we are in the church. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally without making you feel foolish. I'm sure that there are specific answers in specific situations. Now, I myself have been in some very difficult and, I think, untenable positions, indefinable positions, as a missionary. The question often arises, well, what if there is literally nobody else that could do the job? I don't think this happens very often in this country. Be very careful before you say that there isn't anybody else who could possibly do the job. It has happened, in my experience, in the jungles of Ecuador. For example, when my first husband was killed, he was killed along with four other missionaries. Three of these four, five men spoke the Quechua language. They were the only male missionaries in the jungle who spoke that language. They were all killed at once. Doesn't fit in with my ideas of the way God's supposed to do things either, but God shakes up our categories again and again. And here I was, a woman, alone on a jungle station, having to do 50 things for which I was not prepared. One of them was to take over the training of the church. Within just that first two years, we had a body of about 50 believers, baptized believers. And one of the last things Jim said to me when I said, what will I do if you don't come back? He said, you've got to teach the believers. So there I was. There was literally nobody else that could have done it because we had no scriptures at all. There was nobody that could read Spanish. There was nobody who had any training at all. And if they could have read Spanish, they didn't know how to translate into Quechua. And the Indians were not Spanish speakers. So this was a very highly uh, unusual situation. And I was in what I would call a position of expediency. Now, even there, I succeeded in never getting up and preaching a sermon on a Sunday morning. You might say that this is hair splitting, but to me it was extremely important to teach those Indians that it was their responsibility to run that church and to teach those men that that was what they had to learn. And so on Saturday afternoon, one of the three or four young men that my husband had just begun to train as leaders in the church, would come up to my house and we would sit down together with the Spanish Bible. These three or four men spoke just enough Spanish so that we could translate into Quechua together. And we would translate a very short passage of scripture. We would talk about it. I would explain it to him and he would come up usually with illustrations from his jungle life. Then he would get up the next morning and preach the sermon. Now, he didn't preach a very good sermon. I could have done a whole lot better. And this brings me back to that question of competence again. I, I think I could preach a lot better than a lot of preachers I know. That does not give me a license to preach. And I felt that this was a common sense, practical way of teaching these Indians the basic principle that the responsibility of leadership in the church was theirs. And it wasn't very long before they were taking over the leadership. And so, as long as it is an expedient, as long as you recognize that it is not the norm and you're work, trying to work yourself out of a job, then I think there may be a very few rare cases in which this is allowable. The best example, the best metaphor that I can think of besides the one of marriage that illustrates this initiation and response that I'm talking about, and I think will help us in, in any practical application within the church, is that of the dance. And the dance is an old metaphor which the Christian imagination has often used throughout its history to describe what does take place in a complementary relationship. I have lived my whole life without ever learning to dance, and I feel greatly deprived thereby. But I know enough about dancing to know that it does take somebody to initiate and somebody else to respond. And if both people decide to initiate, there isn't going to be a dance. <laughs> if both people want to respond, there isn't going to be a dance. But is there any more beautiful sight than to see a man and a woman dance together, each of whom knows exactly what his role is 
and each of whom, by the perfect execution of that specific role, frees the other one to execute his role. This is all we're talking about. Every single hour of this conference, that's what we've been talking about. By the man's being fulfilled in the wife's having been made for him, the wife will inevitably be fulfilled, as we just heard, whether he likes it or not, he's going to be fulfilled. There is no escaping the joy that's going to come through this working together of this complementarity. Orchestration would be another illustration of body life. Every member with his own part to play, one leader who orchestrates and suppresses the violins over here and brings out the oboes or the flutes over here for the combined beauty of the whole. And the, they're working together, each frees the other. I'm going to finish in just about two minutes. So you're actually going to have a little breather before supper time. The last thing I want to say is that I believe that sexuality has its fulfillment in heaven in ways which are so far beyond our imagination that God didn't dare to give us a clue about them. He's given us just one clue, the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think it's going to be so great, so ecstatic, so thrilling, that it would have been as dangerous for God to have given us any clues about it as it would be for a parent who brings home a Christmas present to tell the child that it's there on the closet shelf. The parent doesn't even tell the child about the surprise that he's got in store for him because the kid would never be able to keep his mind on anything else. And I don't think any of us could have possibly kept our minds on our jobs here if we knew what God knows about sexuality. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, yes, but the Bible says there isn't going to be any sex in heaven. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says that we will be like the angels who neither marry nor are given in marriage. The Bible tells us what we don't do. It doesn't tell us one thing about what we do do in heaven. Imagine the courage of the Creator who thought up this whole business of sexuality. Thank him for the variety, the joy, the interest, the fascination that he has put into life because of it. How desperately we would impoverish ourselves if we succeed in erasing this distinction. So let me say what I said last night. May God give us courage and grace to be men and women under God. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>